Welcome to another episode of Red and Black, where your conservatism is not just the color that you're used to. I'm Lenny McAllister, and don't mind me, I'm just here to read your emails on Wuhan. And so are these other three people right here, starting with the lady down there that has her, dare I say it, I digress juice today, Kira Davis. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to join Chris today. It's been a real rough day, Lenny. Our our esteemed warden Newsom came out to tell us that, um, oh, just kidding about the June 15th date when the state's going to be free. I've changed my mind. I'm holding on to emergency powers and I'm keeping the mask mandate. So, yeah. That is, little... that is the governor buzzing you and wondering why you're talking bad about him, apparently. <laughs> Probably. I wouldn't be surprised if he has my joint app. <laughs> but I, well, listen, I'm going to make sure I alleviate your concerns and calm your nerves by saying I'm not going to get caught up in that. And I digress. I'm going to go over and I'm going to allow the man that prompted this whole tradition, Dr. Christopher Metzler, the red and black wine connoisseur of the show. <laughs> Hello, sir. Hello. Now, you notice that I am not wearing either a do-rag or a bonnet. You you didn't get the memo? No, you I did not. Email? I did not. Monique was very clear. Don't do that in public, y'all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I do not have a do rag on. This is a scarf. This is a head wrap. Do you people see what I have to deal with? Three men on the show. You know, know I, I would rather it be like a, like an Eric Kabadu type of thing. That would be awesome. Oh, that would be awesome. I do that sometimes, but then what happens because the screen is too small, my head gets cut off. So you can't really appreciate. Oh the Erica Badu rap, but I have Erica Badu raps. I love a good head rap. And and Jeff, you don't want her to go all Erica Badu because then you're going to have to call Tyrone. So let me come <laughs> to you now anyway. Now that you're calling Tyrone, tell me something good, Mr. Charles. Oh, man. Uh, well, it's Friday. That's good. Woo! Well, and if you're watching it, it's Saturday. It's the I weekend. It's Saturday. It, is it, though? I mean... <laughs> The other two were laughing because they're like, if you only were here before you got here with Lenny was talking about his Friday, you wouldn't be saying it's a good Friday. So <laughs> yeah. is it really a good thing that it's Friday, Jeff? Well, I mean, it, it could be Friday. It could be next Friday. I mean, it, 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 at the end, at the end of the day, it's a Friday. I mean, that's well, a Monday. True. And there's yeah. no Debo. So at least it's one of the I mean, or I'm, Friday I'm, after I'm, next. It could be the Friday after next, but then of course, everybody's like- It'll be better if Ice Cube makes another Friday movie. It would be. It would out be. There. Would, Don't would, even put that out there. We do not need another Friday movie. Yes, we do. Yes, no, we, we do. don't. No, you're gonna, they're gonna ruin it. How do you, did you see Bill and Ted's? The new Bill and Ted's are gonna ruin it. Let I never saw the first one. <laughs> they were I mean, can you, look, can you imagine Ice Cube and Chris Tucker talking about we got the platinum plan. Damn! I mean, that would be just <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> and you talk about making people's heads explode about Ice Cube and Trump. No, bad idea. Yeah, no. Bad idea. I'll tell you what is also a bad idea, Kara Davis. Listening to Anthony Fauci at this point in time in his career, how can you be such a revered scientist and continue to play the politics all wrong when it comes to what happened with COVID-19. He had a lane. Talk about the science. Don't talk about the politics. Talk about the science. That's your expertise. And now we are sitting here talking about his emails, motives, and hey, maybe it did come from a lab after all. Well, look, I'll tell you this. First of all, uh, I don't think you got to Chris. You missed Chris. So, Dr. Messler, welcome to the show. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. No, I didn't. I literally <laughs> called him the red and black wine connoisseur of the show. He talked oh, about the head wrap. You got offended. <laughs> then from then he talked about ice cube. So offended. Then he talked about that Friday. I'm so offended that I... Look. <laughs> look. Maybe you shouldn't have any di digression juice. Or maybe, you should only, yeah. maybe you're only allowed to drink it when Lenny digresses. Thank you. <laughs> I heard a D somewhere in that sentence. 
not how it works. Can you please answer my question? I'm sorry, PJ. Okay. Um, <laughs> look. Here's the thing. Fauci is not a scientist. Fauci is a bureaucrat. And we have acquiesced a lot of the American uh, safety net and uh, the American attitude to the notion that this man is a scientist and a doctor, but he really is not. You can, come on guys, just use your brains. You cannot be in a government position for 35 years and not be a bureaucrat. So I don't care how much you want to idolize this guy or lionize this guy. Use your noggin. How does one, How does one? no matter how noble you start when you get to Washington, D.C., how do you keep that nobility for 35 years in the swamp? You can't. Uh, uh, our, I, I can say this now. It's public knowledge. Our former managing editor at Red State worked for Dr. Fauci. He spent the last couple of years writing articles uh, de decrying the uh, notion that we are elevating Dr. Fauci. He hated Dr. Fauci. He got caught. He wrote anonymously. He got caught. He was exposed, but it actually all ended up working out for the best for him. He was able to retire. But I remember one of the things when we would write about Fauci at the site that he would tell us and he's been working for this man for years, what he would say is you need to remember that this guy is not a, is not a doctor. He is a bureaucrat. And so everybody that's taking him serious on, seriously on everything doesn't understand that he's just playing politics. And it's the same, he told me, us, by the way, same thing about the CDC. He was like, the CDC is not a medical department. It is a bureaucratic department. It is a bureaucracy. And that is how, they, that's why the, the president of a teacher's union can go into the center for disease control and, and dictate to them what kind of language they'll use to, to unmask mandates and vaccines. So, I mean, it's vindication in a lot of ways because the mainstream media is finally now covering this and, oh, we can't hide it any longer. This is actually real. But it's also infuriating because we here on the right have been exposing this story for a year and getting our pages banned, getting our accounts banned, getting our website traffic uh, throttled by big tech. It's been a nightmare. It's been a living hell since January trying to do this job and stay alive. And, and we've had to make a lot of sacrifices that even, you know, people that are just writing might not understand. It might feel like, oh, we're being too hard on them. But in order to stay alive, we've had to make a lot of compromises when we knew the truth. We knew the truth. So now the truth is coming out. I mean, I and I can't imagine that it is a coincidence that it's coming out now. To my mind, I've been doing this job long enough to, to know that there's probably another shoe to drop, and the Biden administration is just about to throw him under the bus. Biden came out today and said, there's no way, there are no circumstances under which we would fire Dr. Fauci, but I think that's a red herring. I think there are absolutely circumstances under which they would fire Fauci. I think they are preparing to, and right now, it's just a matter of how much information does Fauci have that could hurt people, and how can they get rid of him in a manner that'll just put him under and not let anyone take him seriously. I, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in Fauci's office right now. Well, he could possibly retire, but I'm, I'm going to let you go for just a second, Kira, because how dare you attack American bureaucracy, which is written constitutionally into our founding documents as You're the fourth rail of government. That's literally American blaspheming. So you got to go for a second. I'm going to our constitutional scholar here because I know you know all about the constitutionality of bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. I do. And so when she talks about this with the email thread and everything else and how he's manipulating all this, can you talk a little bit about one, the political damage it's going to have for the Biden administration? Because look, you know, when people don't trust your medical professionals, it's going to play out eventually. Heaven forbid we have like a fifth spike of COVID, even a slight one going into flu season in the fall. We already heard about, okay, the mask didn't work as much as we thought we were. First, it was don't wear a mask, do wear a mask, don't know if they work, you know, does affect kids, doesn't affect kids. Schools are not safe. Schools are safe. If anything else happens... You know, you would think the Biden administration would continue to churn momentum, 
Midterms are looming, Chris. They are looming. Yeah, and I think, so there are a couple of things. I, I do agree uh, that, in fact, they're getting ready to get rid of him. The question is, how do you do that in a way that limits damage to you? I think that's number one. Number two, as it relates to uh, Tony, uh, I'll, 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 Tony's been around Washington um, since the creation of time. And in fact, he is the ultimate bureaucrat. Look at how much money the man has made. He made more money on an annual basis than the president of the United States, along with several other folks. And, and if you look at Fauci and Bricks, um, they threw her under the bus, but left him standing. But here's the problem. The man is supposed to be this brilliant scientist, and he does not know that you don't put things like this in email? I, 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 I just don't understand why you're doing that. And by the way, you notice his book has been taken down. They're like, right? uh, yeah, <laughs> not so much. Yeah. And so, but, well, but you bring you, up a good point, Chris. Like, where's Dr. Burks? Right. <laughs> Where is Dr. Burks? Why? I think that's a question somebody asked um, on Red State today. Well, in our in our writers' room, we were chatting, and you know, is every I, I totally forgot about her. And I'm I wonder what what I your thoughts too. are, Chris, about like where she went and why she went there. Well, and that's the thing. But in fact, you lana you lionized him. Oh, I got my Fauci ouchy. Look, if this man is oh, such God. this brilliant scientist. He came up with this vaccine. Yeah. Dude, where's the vaccine for HIV, which was originally what you're supposed to be doing? Come on. This, for him, is an opportunity to make money. Biden administration, however, realizes at this time they can't afford the damage. They have enough baggage. They don't want to take him as baggage into 2022. They understand that. Jeff, what are you thinking? You know, when this whole thing broke, I was so tempted to go on Twitter and mute the word Fauci because I'm already <laughs> sick of him. But I knew that all the stuff that was going to come out is just going to be more Fauci, Fauci, Fauci. This dude could have taken a lesson from Icarus because he was on all the news networks. They were like, oh, Fauci, bow down to Fauci, 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 Fauci. We love our Fauci. Over and over and over again, he didn't see a camera that he wouldn't get in front of. Like if if you if he were like in the next room and you were taking a picture of, of one of your kids, he would probably jump in front of the camera. That's how much he loved the camera. So then, uh, and and all this stuff that he was talking about with Hillary Clinton and he was friends with her and he really admires her. Well, he could have learned something from that. I mean, couldn't you yeah. kind of like been like, hey, dog. I mean, you might. I, I don't know how what your email game is like right now. But right? watch what happened to me. So, and, Get so a private thinking, server. I mean, yeah, and we were finding out that we, that we have been lied to. Now, a lot of us already knew that at, to a certain extent we were already being lied to. But how they had to how they tried to suppress that whole thing with, with the, the origin of the virus, whether or not mm -hmm. it was in the lab or what have you. Turns out he has an e he's got an email for that. Mm -hmm. When it comes to hydroxychloroquine, remember? Mm -hmm. oh they were so God. mad about hydroxychloroquine. Oh my gosh. And, and this is proof positive that the only reason, the only reason, no other reason, no other reason, the only reason they oppose hydroxychloroquine is because Trump, though, because Trump said something about it, because Trump touted this, this stuff. So th this doesn't just expose Fauci. It, is, it exposes the entire mach machine. It, it exposes the entire apparatus. And we see, uh, once again, that the nation got played. The media was in on it. Democrats were in on it. And I know Biden's got to be up in that White House like, man, I don't need any more of this shit. Because he's already, mm -hmm. like, like Dr. Messer said, he's, got that, he's still got baggage. That migrant crisis is still going on. Jobless numbers suck. I mean, yeah. they, I think they got a little bit better, but not by much. I mean, the situation in the Middle East, he's just had disaster after, after disaster. And whether they're all his fault or not, it looks bad for him. And when this hammer comes down, if Fauci is forced to resign, there will be no amount of spin that will be able to turn this shit show into a, a, a chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. Let me say this. This is an indictment of Trump, too. 
because he should have fired Fauci. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fired him. And 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 the the more I said last week, the longer all of this goes on, the more I'm shocked that wow, Trump was right. He was actually right about a lot of stuff. But it to be fair, he failed the test because he really he listened to the consultants when he should have been listening to his gut. And in that way, he kind of failed us. And he knew he should have fired Fauci. He knew he should have. And he should have done it. He was he was listening. And so he's gonna he's gonna come out with his big told you so when Fauci goes down, but I don't think he should be able to get away with that. This but, is his failure. But let's let's yeah. let's be fair about this. The pandemic was truly the fog of war. You know, this is a once every hundred year phenomenon. And to your point, Kira, maybe he should have fired Fauci. You know, we can have that that debate, but let's also go back to he didn't necessarily address the pandemic in a warlike manner in the first place. A wartime president, if he was truly about that life, they make split second decisions that are decisive and are bold, including perhaps, I know Tony Fauci's been here for a long time, but dude, you know that ain't right. You got to go. I mean, a wartime president does that because there's no time to play. If you're trying to manage that, and let's not forget, this is in an election year where he was underwater in the numbers at the time. And he's hoping that he can find some momentum and get ideally the economy not to tank too much. Again, another consideration is the fact that when all this was going down and, and Jeff, you brought up the jobs number. So I'm going to go back to Kira before you come back to you and Chris, but 22 million jobs disappeared in one month. Unemployment systems were crashing. Firing Tony Fauci, even this time last year, could have tanked the markets in addition to tanking the job markets. Now, you look at these uh, unemployment numbers, 559,000 jobs added. We're still underwater, 7.5 million jobs. 15 months later, Kira, this is not the recovery we were told we were going to have. And the infrastructure bill, now you're starting to hear about complaints about inflation. I know we don't want to turn into MSNBC all of a sudden, but these are real things that real people talk about because we all know, particularly black folks, last hired, first fired, our numbers are still going to be double the rest of the unemployment rates around the country. So these numbers are particularly bad for us. Yeah, I think you make a good point that he wasn't a great wartime president. He wasn't on a wartime footing. And that's probably the difference between a man who's you know, served. And typically we like our presidents to have served in some capacity. And, and uh, for obvious reasons, Trump didn't have that experience. So that's probably the, the difference between that. I, I think that's a really good point, Lenny. Um, but I, I know the economy was set to come roaring back and then the election hit. I think if we had still had Trump to, to his credit, we would. Ha- I, I do think everything, the reason why the economy hasn't come roaring back isn't because the jobs aren't there. They're there. It's because what the Democrat administration has has done at every corner is to squash American motivation and innovation. And, and so the, the workers are out there for the first time, and not in my memory, the workers are out there. They just don't want to go to work for whatever reasons. And I know that a lot of it's a very popular conservative thing because no conservatives want to be thought of as bad people. So a lot of conservatives will come out and they'll be like, this isn't, this is a conservative misinformation campaign that people are lazy. It's not that people are lazy. They're finding other ways to make money. No, it's not that people are lazy. It's human nature. That's all it is. It's human nature. Why would you go to work at a job that, I mean, I would make that decision. You know, if I had the choice, I would make that decision. Why would you go to the to work at a job that might give you 20 extra dollars a week when for a mere 20 bucks, you know, the expense of 20 bucks a week, you can just get a job from the government and then do whatever it is you want to do on the side. So the Democrat government has worked against human nature and now we're paying the, the price for this. And that's not a shameful thing. That's just a fact. This is reality. It doesn't make you a lazy person because you made that choice. In fact, I think it's a rather intelligent choice, if you ask me. It's a rational it choice. Sense. You're not maybe you're not thinking ahead, right? But but you're you're taking what's offered to you after a cra- pretty crappy year. I don't blame anyone. That's just human nature. So I don't know. You know what? I Biden deserves to go down with this ship. He him and Kamala deserve to go down together. I don't know if they will, but they deserve it. 
Dr. M, real quick, ba based on these numbers, before we pivot over to, to Texas and the heart of Texas real quick, what are you thinking about where the economy is right now and what we need to be mindful of, even as these job numbers came out this weekend? Well, for, first of all, we have to be very clear that as it relates to these numbers, Black people fared horribly in these numbers. So we can talk about a slight improvement. There's not been a slight improvement for Black people as we look at the numbers, our rates are still higher, number one. Number two, I do, in fact, you know, I, I as a, a Caribbean, I am very upset with Kamala. Because, see, usually we have a lot of jobs as Caribbean, so she now has the <laughs> job, all these different jobs. The difference is we actually do them, and we do them well. <laughs> so in this case... Kamala is like, hey, make a talent job and them. Okay, but girl, what are you doing? You ain't doing nothing. So sit down. <laughs> so we've got that. Do what again? Do what again? Say that for us one more time. That, that <laughs> comes straight from the boy. Hey, hey, yeah, exactly. The boy. That's right. Straight from the boy mold. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, speaking of going in your mouth, and don't, don't, oh eat my God, yourself. I don't want to stop. I right? digress. Take your drinks and don't interrupt me. <laughs> Jeff, you and I had a chance to be down in Austin, Texas earlier this week. One, because you live there and me because I got on two planes. And I had a chance to eat a steak for the first time in probably 10 months because I don't eat steak. But um, all that eating of beef is going to go away soon because now... Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, wait, wait. This is probably the most important question that's going to get asked on this panel. How did you have your steak cooked? I don't know. I didn't eat that no. much of it. I think it was like medium done or something you like that. Oh, oh my God. Oh, oh you, you sound I, guilty, Lenny. You, I, you got your steak burned? Hell. Didn't I just say I'm not a steak eater the first time in 10 months? It's not, look, I can afford a steak somewhere every now and then. I don't eat steak. I had a hamburger, a beef burger, and a steak and bacon all within a three day period of time. That's the most I'm going to eat of all three of those things, probably until. January. But but the temperature, I'm very concerned about that. It's mm -hmm. shameful. It really I, is. Like, you don't even know whether it was medium, medium well. Like like they didn't tell you, you didn't ask or yeah, like that's embarrassing, honey. I, I was in the middle of a conversation and this hunk of meat bloop plopped down on my plate. I politely ate some of it because that's what you do in Texas. And then I got caught up in my conversation because I digress. I don't eat meat. So I feel we, like I feel like I just found out that Tim Scott joined the Ku Klux Klan right now. <laughs> well, first of all, it wasn't Tim Scott, but Clarence Bixby actually was a leader in the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, um, yeah, and I bet that I bet he doesn't know how his steak is cooked either. No, yeah. he probably does. Right, he probably does. Right, right. It's if you all wonder what we're talking about, you're watching the show. You're wondering what we're talking about. We're talking about a really serious issue in the black community that's kind of a scourge that has haunted us for a long time. And we don't talk about it a lot publicly because this is in-house stuff. This is in-house pain. You know, this is pain that our culture has experienced. But too many black people order their steaks well done. And it's just, it's a sad, tragic secret that not a lot of people know. But we need to change this. We need to change this now for the future of America and for the future of Black America. Yeah, I posted on Twitter. I mean, as a community, we need we need to do better here. Well, I mean, if I'm going to criticize the Black community, this is where I'm going to criticize them. Yeah, yeah. So if you're, if this you're is a horrible right aspect of Black culture right here. Like, absolutely. If you're in a chat right now, I'm going to ask you to put down your email address, and we're going to send you a text to Free Beef. That's going to be F R E E B E E F so that we can send you a brochure so that Jeff can lead you to the light. Yes. <laughs> we yes. should put out a chart how you should have order your steak. Yes. That would be very helpful. You do realize that will be on the, the promos of this show this week. <laughs> so thank that you for the true. idea. I digress. Can I please get to the topic that I wanted to ask <laughs> that about? That was my fault. I digress. Which is the, the stuff, but, but you have no wine, so you're not allowed to digress. <laughs> I've got water. You can digress. Gatorade or whatever the, the other code word is for drinking. <laughs> um, what are we going to do with this cyber hacking phenomenon? One is troubling enough, and that was gas. Now, 
beef is not gas. You can't put it in your car, but hell, it's food. And yeah. it's food for a lot of people. And we're talking about shortages all over again, Jeff. I'm going to start with you as the Texan. But this is problematic because we're talking about this infrastructure stuff from Biden. And yet we're having these cyber hacks. I understand that these are private organizations. But there's a federal responsibility for national sovereignty to prevent this from happening. Well, I mean, it's just like when we were talking about this last time with the with the with the pipeline issue. And my question is and always will be, what are we going to do about it? Now, I didn't get to a chance to really dig into the story, but the fact that there is yet another cyber hack and it's making me wonder why wasn't this happening under the last administration? I'm not necessarily blaming Biden for this, but why why now and what and what's going on is this coordinated or did they just see that this russian group was able to get away with it and now more are going to be piling on i i don't know what's going on here i i don't, I don't understand and i'm really hoping that this doesn't become a trend i mean I, I hope that our people at at homeland security are on top of this and figuring this out but if this keeps happening it's going to show a lot more vulnerabilities and if it continues to be allowed it's only it's only, it's, a, it's like a bully. If you, if you let them do what they're doing and you don't do anything about it, they're going to they're going to get worse and worse and worse. And that's what I can possibly see happening here if something isn't done about it. Hopefully, like I said, DHS is, is on the job and they're going to shut this down. But I'm, I'm a little bit concerned. Chris, the lights are next. And honestly, this this gets you back to me. We talked about this. I said last week it was if we find out that, that COVID-19 escaped a lab from Wuhan, will there be any type of military intervention as a result? You said no. I'm gonna ask a similar question. If these cyber hacks continue and it's coming from one common source, are we gonna end up having a true cyber war where we're gonna see, oh, they took out our beef. There's a reason why the lights in North Korea all went out all at once for a weekend. And it's gonna start this back and forth or are we just sitting ducks here and we're just going to have to kind of absorb this and kind of be cautious to Jeff's point? Well, but to the point of a wartime president, clearly this administration has no clue, no idea that this is in fact war. Look, it is a cyber war. Our capabilities as a country really outshines everyone else. Yes. So why are we not engaging in just outright, outright war, cyber war? I mean, look, this is like, you know, we need to we need to take a lesson from the hood right here, okay? We need to not only do a drive-by, we need to just go knock on some doors and say, what? What you gonna do? And essentially blow up their structures. But but it seems like they're like, okay, so we're going to warn them um, that such actions won't be tolerated. They're like, yeah, okay, thanks for the warning. And by the way, we're going to cut your damn lights off. So let me, let me ask this then. So Kira, does that mean that A, the United States probably knows who it is, and B, doesn't want to pick that fight because that's Debo, back to the, the next Friday and Friday analogy. They don't want to pick a fight with Debo, so they're just going to, you know, shake their fist and go back home with Craig. No, this is the minute. I've got so many thoughts. The administration knows who this is. Of course. The, Jeff, the answer to your question is, yes, this is Biden's fault. This happens a lot. We see this throughout history. You can point to any presidential um, uh, switch and you can see the difference in terrorist views, right? So a great example and a blatant example is Jimmy Carter to to, mm -hmm. to Rick, right? Uh, and then a lot of people accused the terrorists of of all of of colluding with Reagan, like suddenly Reagan became president, and they were like, "Oh, we're releasing all of our our prisoners," and they're like, "Oh," and our press was like, "Oh, Reagan, see, he was in 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 cahoots with the terrorists to make himself look better." No, what happens is when a strong president comes in, the the saber rattlers back off because they know we can destroy. We other countries, even China could cause us a lot of li life loss and a lot of problems, but it wouldn't last long enough for us to lose. We can level anybody on earth. We have the technology and the military power to do it. 
It's just the willpower. And so when there's a Democrat president that's a weak, weaker willpower to deal with other cultures the way they expect to be dealt with, we leftists like to deal with other cultures the way leftists think, you know, we should all be relating to each other. And that's not how it works in the rest of the world. Most of the world responds to strength and particularly despots respond to strength. So Biden is not only is Biden weak as a Democrat, he, he is literally frail. I think everybody else looks at our president and knows that he is not well, that he, and, and so he's not strong. So we're vulnerable. They paid that. The government facilitated the payment mm -hmm. of that oil pipeline ransom. We do not negotiate with terrorists for this very reason. Because what happened? Another attack. Does the government know who it is? Absolutely. They're just proxies for our, our frenemies. For Russia and China, mm -hmm. proxies. But we talked about this on the show last week or the week before. It's not like Russia didn't know or approve of that hack of the pipeline. Of course they knew. It's a test run, you guys. It's a test run. These are all test runs. And I've been having some conversations with people with sources from different, you know, local governments. And there's a lot of chatter going around that we're going to see a bigger attack. So, by the way, people, I think you should be prepared to, you know, for some kind of, of infrastructure interruption and, and prepare your family. Make sure that you have supplies. I'm not saying you're going to be going months without stuff, but you might go days or weeks without some of the creature comforts that you're used to. Be prepared. Get your batteries. Get your flashlights. We are weak. We are so weak. America as embodied in the, in the form and figure of Joe Biden has never been more vulnerable. It is a scary time. Yes, our government knows exactly where these hacks are coming from and they know more are coming. And the reason they don't stop it is because they're in league with these people. It, Joe Biden is in league with China. He gets paid by China. The Clintons got paid by China. That's no longer even political. That's just facts. So you can tell and, them really upset and, about and that does present a problem, I mean, because when you do have a leader who is perceived as as weak, which, by the way, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't disagree that uh, that the rest of the nation sees it that way. That's a problem. I mean, Lenny, you brought up, you know, maybe they know who it is, but they're afraid that it's Debo or whatever. That shouldn't be because we're Debo. Right, right. We are Debo. Now, yeah. I'm not saying that we need to go around bullying people, but we are Debo. We should have that level of force it to be able to level any organization that tries to pull off a cyber attack instead of facilitating payments to them. So that that's why I say, I mean, I hope, I mean, I don't, I hope that somebody in the Department of Homeland Security does something about it because I, I don't think that Biden will take a tougher stance towards this. Well, but they here, and I was going to come to you, Jeff, anyway, I was going to tease Kara for a second, but you know, Jeff in the head wrap, I, I don't want to get on her anymore because she'll get mad. It's cute when Chris does it. When I tease Kara, she <laughs> gives up. me she gives me the Lucy treatment. She's like, I'll give you five reasons to stop talking about me. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm not going there with you. Um, but Jeff, I do want to go there with you. It's interesting we're talking about Biden being frail and not standing up and everything else. Biden was in the room when President Obama took out Osama bin Laden. You would think, now, I mean, and I understand, Kira, the eye roll. Well, you see me roll my eyes, oh, yeah. like here's, Obama did that. I, I get that, but here's my thing. <laughs> my thing is, if you're part of that administration, and you've literally been in Washington, D.C., as long as I've been alive, you would think that you'd be able to find some type of gumption to push back proactively before it gets to this point in time, right, Jeff? What I mean, but, am but, I but, that right? But, but he would have to remember that he was there. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for saying what I was thinking. <laughs> just like, he'd have to remember he was in the room He's with not Hillary in and the rest of them. Biden is not in charge. And wasn't he the one that told Obama not to conduct yes. that raid? Yeah. Yes. So I mean, we already have an indication there of how he's going to approach this, and it's. It's scary as hell. That I mean, be a li but isn't that look? Isn't there nothing like experience being a teacher telling you, look, you were the one that said don't do this, and look how it turned out. Right. You were wrong, Joe. Maybe if you become president, you need to reevaluate how and why you got to that decision back then, just in case you have to go through. And ironically enough, we're almost literally ten years to the day. I think they took out Osama bin Laden in May of 2011. 
10 years later, we're dealing with these, uh, these attacks. You would think, Jeff, that he would have something to lean on. I understand, Chris, he has to remember, but somebody remembers that Biden was in the room. Yeah, and and to, and to Kira's point earlier about you know his interest, I'll, I'll call him his interest in China. How could we come to any other conclusion if he were to take strong action against China? Our our media would nobody would bash him for it. Our media would be like, yeah, Biden, because right. pretty much anything he does, they're gonna say, yeah, Biden. So he doesn't really, and unless there's something I don't know about. He doesn't have anything to lose by going after these entities. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if people on his staff are telling him, yeah, we probably should do something about this. And then others are like, no, no, no. I mean, to me, where's the strength? I'm not saying we need to go bomb somebody because we don't. I'm, I'm very much in, in yeah, favor of non-intervention. But defend us. We need to defend ourselves. Like if somebody's, if people are doing cyber attacks, they need to know that all kinds of horrible shit will happen to them if they conduct a cyber attack. If I didn't have a, that's why I didn't have a problem with Trump talking about fire and fury with North Korea. It may never come to that, but they need to know that some stuff can go down if they poke the poke the bear the wrong way. Biden is just not that type. Well, hold on first, Jeff. Those are the two people drinking. You're the one that keeps using the S word. What is exactly in that Gatorade? <laughs> like, like, so it's, it's water. Like, it's Gatorade and Red Bull or something along those I'm lines. getting a contact buzz. Yeah, yeah. that's what it must be. Um, <laughs> Chris, I mean, what he's saying makes sense, but this ain't going away. I mean, you mentioned that yourself. This is number two. Kira brought it up. It's a test run. We have heard about these conspiracy theories about how we're going to be attacked for 10 to 15 years now. And it seemed like science fiction until two weeks ago. Yeah, but look, look, here's the thing. I mean, as it relates to, it's not only about Biden, it's about his ambassadors and representatives. Mm -hmm. The other countries are looking at them like, yeah, what are they going to do? What is Tony Blinken going to do as Secretary of State? Not a damn thing. He is not going to do anything. Look at who he's uh, putting in. Uh, ambassador seats, the former mayor of um, L.A., like, what? Uh, what? And I mean, he, and Chris, so hold on. Hold on. Oh, I, I want to ask a question before you continue, because it's an interesting point you brought up, and it made me go back a little bit in history. If you think about the first year of the first term of Democratic presidents, you can see some of the wrangling and pushback. Let's go back to 2009 and the saber rattling from North Korea, the reset that went wrong, how Syria started ignoring the red line and all the stuff that happened with Obama during his apology tour during the first 12 to 18 months that he was in office and the aftermath of that, which is, you know, part of that is the, the continued Syrian civil war and eventually ISIS. If you go back to 1993 and what Bill Clinton had after H.W. Bush was in office for a year, you had the whole balkanization issue that happened with the Balkan states. Mm -hmm. and how that devolved as well. If you go back to Carter in 1977, you had detente and how that was just supposed to be a reality. That led to the, to the crisis of confidence. You know, is, there is something to be said, maybe, and I'm going to ask you as the guy that's been around this for much longer than us, there is something to be said about that first year of a first-term president, but then even more so, one party's more of a hawk, one party's more of a dove, and you could see the geopolitics respond to that. Yeah, well, and, and, and here's the thing. Relative to the first year from a national security standpoint, because that's the topic that we're focusing right now, um, it is an unmitigated disaster. It is not going to get better. It is not possible for it to get better because one, he's not engaged. Number two, his proxies um, are weak. And, and so there's gonna be, look, at the by the end of this first year, he will be seen as weak and a sitting duck on the global stage. I don't care that he's going to visit the queen at Buckingham Palace and then he's gonna talk to Putin at the G7, nobody cares. Because at the end of the day, you will see him. Imagine for a moment, the visual, when they do uh, the class picture, oh, 
that's going to be a very terrible visual of him standing up there with the rest of the world leaders. And, you know, it is what it is. You can't do anything about that except for the fact that we are now seen as weak. Because if we weren't seen as weak, they never would have done it. And if they did it the first time and got away with it and we facilitated that, Okay, all bets are off. Just y'all just keep on doing. We're gonna we're gonna help y'all get some more money. This is this is an absolute disaster. It's an unmitigated disaster. Yet the media is fawning over, as Jeff said, what he's done. He is bringing dignity back to the United States on the world stage. No, he's not. He looks like a buffoon. No, we're a joke. We're a joke. It's buffoonery. Speaking of a joke, and I know it's a transition because I don't know how to transition from foreign affairs to the NFL. So <laughs> work with me on this one, please. Y'all y'all tease me about my inability to really know how to eat a steak, but please <laughs> give me grace on this. Kara, you wrote an article in regards to the race norming of the NFL and the whole situation with brain injuries. And now to hear where this is going, I'm just going to be quiet and let you run with this because... Every time you look, this is where I mean, Dave Chappelle had when keeping it real goes wrong. This seems to be another example of when being woke goes wrong and people kind of sometimes let it go over their heads. Yeah. Did you guys know about this before this story broke this week? Did you, you knew Chris? You heard yeah, of it. So, yeah. The race norming thing has always been controversial. And yeah, it, the liberals I, have always moved it forward, but now it's bitten them in the ass. I've never, uh, I've never heard of it. I didn't know it existed. And then the other day, the AP put out this very casually put out this headline. Mm -hmm. did, I thought this should be a big scandal. And the headline is uh, was something like NFL agrees to stop practice of race norming and 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 deal better with black players. And my response was like, um, what? Like, what's race norming? And why would you just drop this here like this? Why isn't this a huge story? And so I dug, and even to dig into that AP article, I actually had to dig further because they didn't even really explain it. To them, it, it seemed like an inconvenience, but not like a terrible thing. And to me, I'm like, okay, after the summer of Black Lives Matter, NFL and kneeling and the NFL lecturing to us for the last year about how bad the rest of us are, or they've decided to embrace Black Lives Matter, then we see this, this should be a huge scandal. Well, race norming, for those of you who don't know, is the practice of evaluating the cognitive functions of Black people at a lower level. So starting at a lower base, um, the idea... <laughs> The idea being that that um, you can't, basically it's the soft bigotry of low expectations mm -hmm. in a policy. You can't, as a black person, you're not going to be able to achieve cognitively as a sa at the same level as a white person. So you kind of like even those scores so that you even the playing field. It was started by Carter. That's what I couldn't figure out, Lenny. Like, why am I not, why is this not a huge deal? Why aren't the liberals like on top of this? Don't they hate Roger Goodell? Isn't he a filthy Republican? Like, they should be on his case. Well, then I figured it out. It's a liberal policy, right? Mm -hmm. And even the writers, the few writers, the few liberal writers, no conservative writers had covered this. I mean, I, I didn't cover it before. I didn't know. The few liberal writers that covered it, even they were like, well, to be fair, this was a policy that was made to correct racism. And I'm like, how can you even freaking get on board with that? How very dare you? Are you not supposed to be, oh, thank you, like, well, their intentions were good. How could you even say that the intention of this was good? What it says is black people are too dumb to be brain injured. It's insanity. And but here's, here's what the crazy. Happened. When you correct a lie with a lie, you get another lie. When you try to correct the lie that black people are dumber than white people with the lie that in order for them to achieve, you have to lower the bar, you get the lie of race norming and what happened in the NFL. And we should all be disgusted that this is, isn't a huge scandal. Chris, I'm, I'm, let me go to Jeff for a second. Here's the crazy thing about this, right? So everybody in the NFL, everybody in the NFL had to go to some college. It's not the NBA. It's not Major League Baseball. It's not the NHL. 
You cannot go into a junior league, a minor league, whatever, and basically fail your way out of high school or be marginal or whatever and just go straight to the pros. You must go to college. And on top of that, unlike one and done in basketball, you must at least be three years removed from your high school graduating class before you're eligible to go into the NFL draft. Why am I saying all that, Jeff? If you're going to do race norming based on aptitude and call it fair, you don't do it with a bunch of black folks that are already went to college, right? But this is the thing, I mean, and I didn't, I didn't, I knew nothing about this until I listened to Kira's podcast earlier today. I, I didn't just listen to myself; I just listened to Kira. And <laughs> but out bounce. <laughs> and no, I was I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. I'm not going to. Yeah, it. you are inside though. Um, but <laughs> I just, I was, um, I was blown away when I heard this. Like, and I'm like, and when I was thinking about it, I was like, this is the, this idea comes from people like white progressives who always try to lower the bar for black Americans, who always think that black Americans are not good enough, not smart enough to overcome the obstacles that our society has placed in front of us. But the idea that it's still happening and no, and like Kira said, nobody's talking about it. Again, I say it all the time. The left does not care about black people. The left does not care about racism. They like racism as long as they can use it as a weapon. If they were actually concerned about racism, they would say, hey, this is a ridiculous practice. We we should have gotten rid of, rid of this a long time ago. This would be a huge, huge deal. Even if it did happen under Carter, they can say it shouldn't have happened under Carter, but still, we we need to do better as a, as a society. And I believe, Akira, in your podcast, you talked about how they tried to blame Republicans for, on it or, or, or try to try to put it off on Republicans. I'm like... They just tried to say do. Republicans never want solutions. They... they, they they reject every solution, um, and and they and they never, but they never want to offer any of their own to solve racism. Yeah, and and that's the thing, and there's truth to that, but that doesn't mean that that, that doesn't get you off the hook for having bad solutions that are more damaging, right? I mean, so so yeah, the Republicans have their issues, but don't don't try to use that to deflect. You guys have shitty ideas. You guys don't come up with good ideas for the black community. You are destructive. And it's just, I mean, it's kind of like what Saul Alinsky said, or a lot of people have said this, always accuse your enemy of that which you are doing. So they always say that always oh, Republicans' policies that, that have harmed the black community. It's all conservatives' fault. We've done nothing wrong. We've been as pure as the driven snow. But th this stories like this are an example of why we can't trust progressives either. So let, let me bring it home for for y'all just a second. And, and Chris, you can chime in after I do this because people are like, it's the NFL. What are you really caring about? Let's put it in context of the NFL, right? So these policies started coming in in the 1970s, late 70s, early 80s, right? That was during a time where general managers wouldn't draft black quarterbacks because they were too stupid right. to play their position. You want to know another position they couldn't play in football because they were too stupid and didn't have the leadership capabilities? They couldn't be centers either they would take black quarterbacks and make them wide receivers they were they, they couldn't be coaches so they could be a, a position coach but not a coordinator they can be a coordinator and they couldn't be a head coach we still have had those situations going on today we have black quarterbacks whose aptitude are still being questioned justin fields literally just came out of ohio state and there were rumors about his aptitude and he scored one of the highest Wonder lick test scores that they've ever mm -hmm. had in the combine. Why mm -hmm. am I saying this? When you have a race norming policy trying to quote unquote even the score done by team administrations, do you think the same team administrations, Chris, run by GMs, run by VPs, run by certain owners, are not going to take those same mindsets and apply it to personnel? why we can't have this quarterback, why we can't have this person be our captain, why they're not eligible for certain leadership bonuses in their contracts, and why we have to lowball them despite their successes on the field when it comes time to a renewed contract. Well, so a couple of things. Number one, the race norming thing popped up in the news as a result of the billion-dollar settlement Right. Uh, that they had. That's the only reason that it popped in, and there they agreed to do that. So that's number one. Number two, 
you know, we look, we just simply overlook the Carter administration and the destruction that they did relative to race. We just simply walk on by that because we've spent so much time talking about uh, the hostages and, and those kinds of things. But if you look at what happened in the Carter administration from a race standpoint, the issue was white liberals who are saying, oh, I feel so bad for you little black people. You can't help yourself, so let me help you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it's a result of housing policy. It's a result of the lot, a lot of the policies. But we've given the Carter administration a pass on that. And when people say, for example, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, formed, helped form the NAACP. So a couple of things about that. Number one, as it relates to Eleanor Roosevelt, she was the one who wrote this very nice poem. One of my best friends is black, therefore I'm not racist. Eleanor Roosevelt was the one when there was a fight between W.E. Du Bois um, relative to the whole I charge genocide thing, she was not on the right side relative to that. So if we look at it historically, from a democratic standpoint, and even though they keep blaming Republicans from, uh, you know, as it results to race, yeah, we do have our own issues, but relative to Carter, relative to the administration before Carter, we have to look at the fact that these policies were put in place by primarily democratic administrations. Their view was, we will help you be better people. You're terrible people because you're not Christians. We'll help you do that. Um, and that that was, you know, so that whole, uh, re remember, Walter Wright, Walter White, W.E. Du Bois, when Du Bois was going to go abroad to the UN in the I Charge, We Charge Genocide petition, Eleanor Roosevelt was the one who had his passport yanked so he couldn't go aboard. Um, you know, so that's the whole thing. So from an institutional standpoint, if we want to talk about institutional racism and discrimination, let's go back and examine how right Democrats have codified uh, racism. And so that, 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 switched. And before we go, yeah. what I want to do is I want to just remind everybody that Chris knows what the hell he's talking about because he was standing right beside Mrs. Roosevelt when he saw went down. <laughs> sure. That's At true. the garden party. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So let, let, let's, let's wrap the show. I'm going to ask one quick question then we're going to go from there, which is simply, um, Kira, were you the person that lobbied for the gender, you know, specific <laughs> crash dummies as this show <laughs> crashes to an end? Uh, no, but there is a Democrat who's lobbying for for gender equality and crash test dummies. And I can't think of a better way to end this episode because we've been talking about horrible Democrat ideas and pointless Democrat ideas that do nothing for anybody. And this is another one. But these are the things that are, you know, I think what happens is these people get bored. We are our, our our government is in session way too long, if you ask me. I think the government should be in session for 30 days a year. That's it. If you can't get the people's business done in 30 year uh, 30 days, go the hell home and live under the laws that you've created. You know, go back to your job, go back to your because these people are too bored. They're at their job. These are career politicians. What do you <laughs> yeah, mean go back to your that's job? The problem. They're that's gonna be the problem. They're We're gonna go around right? the block, and that's what they're gonna do. Were you screaming, Lenny, for for uh, equality in crash test dummies? You know, or were you are you were you one of those people who's screaming for a Willy Wonka prequel? You know, no, I was I, actually I I was, what the rest of us think. I was I was screaming for a, a, a reboot of Fred Sanford so I can hear somebody say you big dummy, not crash <laughs> dummy. You got it all wrong. Fred Sanford can't survive these days. He could not survive. There you oh, go. Yeah, he would have been See, him, oh, yeah. him bunker. And, and look, that's a bad joke. If you had, you know, Fred Sanford, Archie Bunker, and George Jefferson walked into a bar. Yeah. <laughs> they all three would call somebody an H word. And I won't say the H word. I'm yeah, throw say, Don Rickles in there too. Oh, oh <laughs> my gosh. That sounds like a fun oh, bar, goodness. though. <laughs> it would. Yeah, it, it would. would. Kira, what you got going on this week? 
Um, I'm doing, uh, 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 listen, tune into Just Listen to Yourself. Jeff mentioned that I talked about this race norming thing. I did a mini episode on that. And then I also did um, colorblindness, which is a subject that keeps coming up among conservatives. So I discussed uh, the ish, the idea of us trying to be colorblind and why I don't think that that's the goal and why I don't think we should be messing with that. And uh, and, and so that's pretty much what I, what I want to plug most importantly this week. Mr. Austin, thank you for having me in your town. What do you got going on this week? Yeah, same old, same old. Check me out on A Fresh Perspective with Jeff Charles, my YouTube channel, and also audio podcasts. You can get it on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The audio podcast has much different content from my live streams on my YouTube channel, so check me out. Um, Mr. Peabody, <laughs> with all the historical references, what what historical thing are you going to be crafting today and what are you going to bring to us next week? Well, I, I actually this week I've got uh, three speeches that I'm doing on critical race theory, um, explaining what critical race theory is and actually criticizing critical race theory. Um, at Columbia, I was educated in critical race theory so that I'm able to criticize critical race theory. Mm -hmm. I can't criticize yes. what I don't know. Very <laughs> bad. <laughs> Good. So I'll be doing three of those uh, th uh, this week. So uh, that's that's on my schedule for this week. And what Chris is not telling you is that he is so talented. He's doing all three of those speeches at once. Because that's how he <laughs> I, I would believe it. I, mean, I would believe it. A lot of people don't know, but Chris actually established Columbia University in seventeen thirty-eight. Right. Yes. Right in Harlem. Yeah. <laughs> he did. Seventeen thirty-eight. Yep. After he left Mrs. Roosevelt with the whole situation with W.E.B. Du Bois. I digress. Take a drink. I'm leaving because I'm not allowed to drink. Because Lord knows if I were allowed to drink, this would be a day that I would drink. Yes. <laughs> Maybe not. Listen, folks, you know we love you. We always enjoy catching up to you. Um, Kara is inviting you back next week, so you have to take the invitation. If we invite you back, eh, it's not so much. If no. Kara says it, you got to do it. Don't so I'm telling rude. you. Don't be rude. Got to do it. Share the love. Share the likes. Talk to you soon. TCNGB. Take care and God bless. Peace.